Hi, uh, so I'm Agustin and I will be speaking now about my first debugging experience with Rust. So this was a couple of years back. Uh, it was my first project and I wanted to learn a little bit how it worked. It was uh, an interesting problem that helped me understand how the borrow checker works. And I think that it's a great example for someone who's just starting on the language and is familiar with other for, uh, programming languages, but not particularly with uh, uh, oddities of Rust. Uh, it, it's also a good example because I did a lot of stupid stuff that I could have avoided and prevented a lot of uh, errors, like actually reading the documentation. This is not an answer. Ah, there we go. Yeah. So, so yes, uh, I will mostly speak about uh, my project, which was creating an emulator for the Space Invader console in Rust. The Space Invader console, it's a very um, uh, nice project in the sense that it's Fairly simple if you're an experienced programmer, but complicated enough that will force you to think and to uh, use language features that are not just for loops. It's uh, the the console. It's made out of the CPU Intel i 80 which was one of the first 8-bit CPUs, and a bunch of external hardware. At the time. Uh, the tough shared memory. So you will say uh, uh, it's what it was called memory mapping, and you will say, well, from this address to this address, uh, the those bytes are allowed to be written and read by external devices. The Intel 8080 CPU works in a different way. So to communicate with the um, with uh, with the external devices, you will use what was called I/O pins that were input-output uh, pins to which you would connect your devices. The idea was, now the CPU has two instructions, one that it's called in and, one, and another one that it's called out. Each instruction has an argument. So with the in instruction, you store the content of the pin ID of that argument into the accumulator, and with the out instruction, you store the accumulator into the device, uh, external device whose ID is the argument. The problem that I uh, encountered was when trying to design this part in code. <coughs> the, um, the main problem was because I tried to do something that was as extensible as possible. My idea in term was, well, I will first create this uh, console, and then I will modify it slightly to make some kind of fantasy console based on the uh, Intel in the Space Invaders. So, for example, if I wanted to still use the Intel 8080 CPU, but create my own uh, imaginary external device, I will be able to do so using threads and interfaces in Rust. So, my first. Oh, sorry, this will look very awkward. My first attempt will look something like this. I have two trays for input and output devices. And these are two examples of uh, input and output devices. Uh, one example will be a button. Uh, the console had, in particular, six buttons. And another example would be a sound device. In this case, the console had uh, an external hardware device that will connect to six different pins. And every pin, when, when you send uh, an instruction to every pin, a different sound will uh, be reproduced. The CPU will have a list of uh, input devices and output devices. The console will be, um, will, will be made out of a CPU and a set of sound devices and bottom devices. The idea would be that, uh, as you see here in, initial, in, in the initial station, that the sound devices and the button devices are shared between the CPU object and the console object, as you can see there. Of course, 
because if you are familiar with Rust, you already see why this will fail in the next slide. Uh, which was my, uh, so I, I tried to, yeah. So what it's saying here is that the um, try round of the input device is not satisfied. And it's explaining, explaining you here that this is actually already uh, resolved to uh, sound and therefore it doesn't work. If you go and read the documentation, and you, which is what I did at the time, you will notice that there is uh, an actual structure to solve this problem, which is a, a reference counter. A reference counter is kind of rather like a boss, but the idea is that it will work when you have to share uh, objects between different owners. But you don't have only one owner for, for, for an object. So the same approach using a, a reference counter uh, is basically the same, but uh, replacing the boxes with initializations of the uh, RC, as you don't see here. And, and that will work fine. Uh, so this compact, I was happy, and then it, it comes the next problem. The next problem is, okay, this works now, but uh, this is not exactly what I need. When you input uh, something in, in the buttons, I need to be able to store that I press that button. Because a different part of the application will have to uh, be able to read the list of buttons and see which button are being pressed to be able to update whatever is happening. So I needed to do some kind of mutability on this, uh, on this object. My first intuition was, well, I'm sure that the uh, RC won't complain if I just make a variable mutable, and like I'm here, and I try to use that. That will fail. Uh, here, yeah. So, again, uh, I learned this way that the RC structure is actually mutable and that it requires you to not change the data. A little bit frustrated, I went back to the book and I started reading again in the same chapter and I found another instruction, another structure that was basically in the same page called RepSub. And it was basically, well, this is the solution when you need uh, mutable data. And I thought, well, amazing. I will just replace all the RC with rough salt because I didn't continue reading. I just read that paragraph and went back to God. And I was very disappointed because this will actually fail again. And some of you may already see why. The change that I did was basically replacing RC with rough salt. And the error that the compiler got me was the following. So what is saying here? What is saying here is that Repsol requires the argument to have a SAS. The problem is because in this case what I had was a Repsol of traits, and the compiler didn't know the size of the trait. I wasn't able to use it. Well, I went back to the book. Um, and I tried something different. I said, well, uh, how do I give a trait the, um, uh, uh, a fixed size? The book said that I should use the box structure. So, went back and I did something stupid again. I basically said, well, I will have a rough set of a trait object. This doesn't work, of course. <laughs> The compiler screamed at me again and said, well, you can't clone this, dude. What, what are you doing? Uh, because if you remember before, the objects that I have have zero ownership. Uh, in my stupidity, I thought that uh, RevCell works similarly to the reference counter in the sense that it will allow multiple owners. I thought that it was uh, re the reference counter uh, rubber, but uh, with mutability enabled. It was not, obviously. So I went back to the book, I kept reading, and I found the solution, which is this. <laughs> it's horrible. <laughs> I, was, I was very disa not disappointed because I understood why this is needed, and 
if any of you don't understand it, I can explain it. It's basically, well, uh, I have a vector of objects that, share, that have shared ownership. Those objects have to be mutable, and they are, um, uh, and they are uh, uh, trait objects. And I understand why all that is needed, and why it's good that it's needed, because the compiler can scream at you, but it felt, well, you, you, can, you can share my feelings, I'm sure. Uh, <laughs> particularly my thought was, well, if I am a co student that has been doing a scheme and Java all my life, and I go to a company and I see that, I would run away. <laughs> so, I, I went to internet and I started trying to read and hoping that there would be a better solution. There is not, but I found an interesting, I found an, an interesting comment in Reddit. Um, we, uh, there was already trading which they basically posed the same uh, question than me, and what they are basically see, saying here is, well, you're right, that is horrible, but you don't actually need to put the shared information on the whole object. It's very likely that the part that is shared is not the whole object, but a particular member. So what you can do is just make your vector a vector of reference content that traits. And the actual implementations have their members that are actually shared wrapped in ref service. I know that this sounds overly complicated, so I will show you the code. Now, it will do something like this. If you see the bottom device, the bottom device have a rush cell of, the, uh, of whether the bottom is pressed or not. And then, here, the CPU, this vector, instead of being that monstrosity, is just a vector of reference count versions of that. Because uh, reference count don't need doesn't need the box, this is actually a fairly new addition. It keeps being very concise. And the implementation here is also fairly straightforward. You just initiate whatever you need. You can then add the uh, input devices to the CPU, and you can comfortably press the button without displeasing the compiler. So basically what I learned here is move, that I should move my complexity down the abstraction, uh, the, the abstraction hierarchy. I don't want uh, all my wrappers and all, all that complexity on the first level of the hierarchy. I want it just in the places in which I need it. It's unfortunate that I don't have an easy way to have it around the abstraction, but I will also argue that it's a good engineering practice to not do what I was trying to do. Another thing that I learned is that uh, I should read all the documentation before jumping into the code, and I will probably be more effective. And uh, it, it was an interesting experience because I also got a very good grasp on the difference between box, reference content, and ref cells. And I think that's all. I went way faster than I expected.